welcome to your virtual tour of the private offices of Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, housed at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia. President and Mrs. Carter founded the Carter Center in 1982. When Jim was involuntarily retired from the White House, <laughs> there was still a lot of things we wanted to do. And we thought and thought about it. And one night I woke up and Jimmy was sitting straight up in the bed. He said, I know what we can do. We can have a place like Camp David where people can come and we can work on negotiating conflicts. So that was the germ of the idea. We've come to the first stop on our tour. President Carter is a proud Navy man. After graduating from the United States Naval Academy in 1946, he joined the U.S. Navy, serving from 1946 to 1961. During his time in the Navy, Jimmy Carter was honored to serve on the USS Pomfret. This detailed replica was gifted to President Carter by a Carter Center donor. I was standing watch on the bridge about two hours after midnight with my feet on the slatted wooden deck when I saw an enormous wave dead ahead. I ducked down beneath the chest-high steel protector that surrounded the front of the bridge and locked my arms around the safety rail. The wave, however, smothered our ship several feet above my head. I was ripped loose, lifted up, and carried away from the ship. I could only swim around in the turbulent water, striving to reach the surface. This was my first experience with impending death, but when the wave receded, I found myself on the main deck directly after the bridge and was able to cling to our five-inch gun. In 2004, a submarine was named for President Carter. The USS Jimmy Carter is a Seawolf-class, nuclear-powered, fast-attack submarine. It is the only submarine named for a living president. New commanding officers have the opportunity to meet with and brief President Carter on their ship's activities. He always looks forward to these briefings. After using a learn-to-paint kit ordered by one of his Navy shipmates, Jimmy Carter began to experiment with watercolors and oil paints. He has continued painting throughout his life, producing more than 100 works. Many are on display at the Carter Center. This portrait of his mother was painted from memory. He painted this image of his father from a photograph the size of a postage stamp. And the painting you see here depicts Rosalind in her 20s. Walking through the hall of this rotunda, you see a gallery of works reflecting chapters in President and Mrs. Carter's life, created by their favorite artists. These meaningful pieces are representative of a specially curated art collection found throughout the center. As we approach Mrs. Carter's office, we see a photo of her with other former First Ladies of Georgia. It was while canvassing for her husband's run for governor of Georgia in 1966 that she became involved in mental health. On the campaign trail, she was overwhelmed by stories from people with relatives who suffered from mental illnesses and were being turned away from facilities. One evening, Mrs. Carter showed up at her husband's campaign rally and joined a receiving line of his supporters. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I want to know what you're going to do for people with mental illnesses when you're governor of Georgia. And he said, we're going to have the best program in the country, and I'm going to put you in charge of it. <laughs> also, outside Mrs. Carter's office is a ceremonial ads. This hoe-like tool on a wooden base with ancestral figure, bird head, and greenstone blade was gifted to Mrs. Carter by New Zealand participants in the Carter Center's Rosalind Carter Fellowships for Mental Health Journalism. Founded in 1996, this fellowship is part of the center's mental health programs. These year-long non-residential fellowships aim to equip journalists from the U.S. and several other countries with resources to produce compelling and balanced reporting on behavioral health issues. The goal is to develop a diverse cohort of journalists who can more effectively report on these topics across evolving and emerging platforms. I want my mental health work to carry on even after there is no more stigma, which 
I'm not sure will come in my lifetime, but there's always going to have to be a lobby to get the services that we need, and I think it will still be very important for the mental health community to come together the way they do now. Here, you see Mrs. Carter's office. It is a warm and inviting space filled with mementos of a life fully lived. It includes photos of her family and friends, awards for her lifetime of work devoted to caregiving and mental health, and a selection of art from some of her and President Carter's favorite artists. On this credenza by her desk, you will see a wonderful photo on the left of Betty Bumpers, a lifelong friend of Mrs. Carter's with whom she co-founded Every Child by Two, now called Vaccinate Your Family. The organization works to protect people of all ages from preventable diseases. Their work centers on educating the public about the importance and safety of timely vaccinations while striving to ensure strong vaccination policies and access to vaccines for everyone including our most vulnerable populations. In the center of the credenza, you will see photos of Mrs. Carter with fellow First Ladies of the United States and close friends, Betty Ford and Lady Bird Johnson. When Mrs. Carter was First Lady of Georgia, she was inspired by Lady Bird Johnson's Highway Beautification Project and began a similar project in Georgia. In the course of this work, she met Lady Bird Johnson and the two became fast friends with a shared vision of preserving native plants. Mrs. Carter worked with Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Ford on a variety of projects over the years, including the 1988 Women and the Constitution meeting held at the Carter Center. On the right is a photograph of Mrs. Carter and Margaret Mead, who was a great inspiration to Mrs. Carter. In her book, Helping Yourself Help Others, she writes, when Jimmy was president, I had the great fortune to spend time with the famed anthropologist Margaret Mead. One of the things I heard her say often was that societies are judged by the way they care for the most vulnerable among them, the poor, the elderly, the mentally ill. Just above these photos is a framed copy of a love poem Jimmy Carter wrote to his wife. It's simply titled, Rosalind. She had smiled, and birds would feel that they no longer had to sing. But it may be I failed to hear their song. Within a crowd, I'd hope her glance might be for me, but knew that she was shy and wished to be alone. I'd paid her sit behind her, blind to what was on the screen, and watch the image flicker on her hair. I'd glow when her diminished voice would clear my muddled thoughts, like lightning flashing in a gloomy sky. The nothing in my soul with her aloof was changed to foolish fullness when she came to be with me. With shyness gone and hair caressed with gray, her smile still makes the birds forget to sing or me to hear their song. Adorning the walls of Mrs. Carter's office, you'll find personal and meaningful art, such as this sketch by Leroy Neiman. Neiman was visiting with Mrs. Carter in her office when her two-year-old granddaughter Margaret, known then as Maggie, arrived. As Mrs. Carter held Maggie on her lap, Neiman pulled out his sketch pad. Within minutes, he produced the drawing, tore it from his pad, and presented it to Mrs. Carter as he was bidding her farewell. You'll also find a portrait of their daughter Amy, as painted by Robert Templeton in 1977. Mr. Templeton went on to paint portraits of President Carter for the Georgia State Senate and for the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. This beautiful rose by Jerome Lawrence was commissioned for Mrs. Carter's 90th birthday by grandson Josh Carter and his wife Sarah. Mrs. Carter first met Lawrence at a Rosalind Carter Symposium for Mental Health Policy at the Carter Center. She is a great admirer of his talent and is inspired by his life story and dedication to the field of mental health. Artist Thornton Oots, whose work President and Mrs. Carter highly favor, painted this image of President Carter, which hangs directly across from Mrs. Carter's desk. President Carter has a painting of Mrs. Carter by Oots hanging opposite his desk in his office, which you will see in a moment. 
This allows them to gaze upon each other as interpreted through the eyes of the same artist. Mrs. Carter at age six by Su Meng Young, painted from a photograph of a young Rosalind Carter, was a gift from the Korean American Democratic Caucus in Los Angeles in 1979. The original photo was featured on the back of Mrs. Carter's book, First Lady from Plains. Mrs. Carter has written five books, two memoirs, and three that focus on mental health and caregiving. Mrs. Carter has received many awards for her work in caregiving, including the Sustaining Presence Award from the Foundation for Interfaith Research and Ministry and Mercy Cares, Mercy Moves Through Me Award. Book Ending the Couch in Mrs. Carter's office is a ceramic bowl made by dear friend and former second lady, Joan Mondale. During the Carter Mondale administration, Mrs. Mondale devoted her energy and influence to promoting support for the fine arts. This piece, which is very special to Mrs. Carter, combines art and award, featuring a stunning Southern Magnolia by glass artist Hans Godo Frabel. It honors Mrs. Carter as the 1996 Georgia Woman of the Year by the Georgia Commission on Women. This is one of 20 Frabel pieces in the Carter Center's art collection. One of the newest additions to Mrs. Carter's office is a printout of a photo of Phyllis Schlafly protesting the First Lady's involvement in efforts to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Schlafly, an outspoken leader against the ERA, was one of 150 protesters at the White House that day. Mrs. Carter deems the failure of the ERA to be ratified as her greatest disappointment of all the projects she worked on during her years in the White House. She asked that this photo be placed in her office as a daily reminder that we are still fighting for equal rights for all women and of the courage it takes to advocate for what is right. Mrs. Carter's collection of small mementos is a cornucopia of reminders of her many trips and events, recognitions, interests, and of course, her family. Her desk is a little cluttered, as one might expect of a working woman who needs tools with an easy reach and always has something still to be decided. As you approach President Carter's office, you see two rare acrylic Andy Warhol paintings of Miss Lillian, President Carter's mother. Warhol, a longtime supporter, gifted these paintings to the Carters to celebrate the opening of the Carter Center in 1986. The center is lucky to have several traditional Warhol prints and sketches in its collection. Just below these paintings, where President Carter sees it each time he enters his office, is a book referencing the duties of the President of the United States. It serves both as a reminder of the office he held and lifelong commitment to making the United States and the world a better place for everyone. As you can see, President Carter's office is a bit more formal than his wife's, although it is not without touches of his personality. The first thing that catches your eye is his desk, it is a replica of the Resolute desk that he used in the White House. Horst Schulte of Chambly, Georgia crafted this replica, as well as the one that is in the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum's Oval Office exhibit. The original desk, a favorite for presidents, was a gift from Queen Victoria to President Rutherford B. Hayes in 1880. It was built from the oak timbers of the HMS Resolute, a ship of the British Royal Navy, which was abandoned in Arctic ice in 1854. American whalers recovered and returned her to the British in 1855. The desk has compartments that are accessible from both sides and a hinged front that many will remember from photographs of President Kennedy's children climbing through. While some of the secret compartments were omitted in the replica, one thing that makes President Carter's desk unique are the initials J.C engraved by the artist in the middle of the center drawer. Behind President Carter's desk is Red Cosmos by renowned Georgia artist Lamar Dodd. To commemorate the opening of the Carter Center, 
President Carter made a special request to Dodd for a work of art to fill this space. A major figure and a leading force in art education in the Southeast, Dodd also served as a goodwill ambassador and cultural emissary for the State Department. President Carter has won three Grammy Awards for his audiobooks in the category of Best Spoken Word Album. He keeps one Grammy on his desk here at the Carter Center. The other two are located in the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum and at the Plains High School Museum, which is part of the Jimmy Carter National Historical Park. He has written 32 books, including memoir, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and children's fiction. Also on President Carter's desk is a small water-filled jar containing a guinea worm. This serves to remind President Carter of his and the Carter Center's long battle to eradicate this scourge many believe to be portrayed in the Old Testament as the fiery serpent. It's caused by a large worm growing inside a human body that uh, penetrates the skin with a terrible sore. And in the process of emerging, sometimes just completely destroys muscle tissue. And when the guinea worm is emerging, it's, it has excruciating pain. A farmer can't go to his fields and work. A child can't go to school. When the Carter Center took on guinea worm in 1986, 3.5 million people suffered from the disease. Today, thanks to the Carter Center and partners, fewer than 27 cases exist in the world and guinea worm could become the second human disease in history to be eradicated. As we continue our tour of President Carter's office, you see exquisite works by Sam Maloof. A renowned woodworker from California, he crafted these single and double rockers. The rockers are apparently as comfortable as they are beautiful because Mrs. Carter often sits in them during meetings. This wonderful bowl, made from Georgia pine, was turned by Georgia woodworker Edward Multhrop. President Carter's own love of woodworking led to lasting relationships with both of these revered makers and their families. Multhrop bowls can often be found as auction items for Carter Center weekend the Carter Center's annual donor retreat and auction. While in the Navy, President Carter began his own lifelong avocation as a woodworker. He started by building furniture for his and Mrs. Carter's unfurnished apartments on base. Later, when he left the White House, his staff gave him a set of woodworking tools for his workshop back home in Plains. He has gone on to craft offering plates for Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains much of the furniture in his and Mrs. Carter's home, cradles for his grandchildren, furnishings for the family mountain cabin, and countless other handcrafted pieces. Sitting in the center of President Carter's office on a Maloof side table is a silk embroidered cat and grasshopper this is a replica of a gift the late Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping of the People's Republic of China presented to President Carter during his 1979 state visit. The original by Grand Master Gu Wincha is so finely woven and detailed that regardless of which side is viewed, the image is the same. All gifts given to a sitting president and valued at more than $150 automatically belong to the U.S. government. As such, the original piece of embroidered art is on view at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum. However, President Carter loved this piece so much, and the gift from Deng Xiaoping was so important to him that this replica was gifted to him by several of the Carter Center's volunteers. President Carter is proud to have normalized relations with China during his term in office and has continued through the work of the Carter Center to work to improve U.S.-China relations. President Carter has been a lifelong lover of the outdoors, steward of nature, and champion of conservancy. While governor of Georgia, he founded the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and worked to protect the Flint River. During his presidency, he was well known for his policies on energy conservation which included the founding of the Department of Energy 
and installing solar panels on the White House. He also fought for and signed into law the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, which protects 157 million acres of land in Alaska. Personally, he and Mrs. Carter are avid fly fishermen, having traveled the world well into their 80s and 90s to fish with a small, close-knit group of friends. As you can see, he keeps binoculars by the window in his office, so that even while working in Atlanta, he can keep up with his love of birding. President and Mrs. Carter, who have recorded spotting over 1,300 species of birds during their lifetime as bird watchers, have gone so far as to get up before dawn on Carter Center election monitoring trips to get in a few hours of birding before reporting to their polling location to observe elections around the world. Since 1989, the Carter Center has observed over 100 elections in nearly 40 countries, many of which President and Mrs. Carter have observed in person. This election observer vest was worn by President Carter in Nepal, where there was a record-breaking voter turnout of 70%. He visited 31 voting sites in Kathmandu during this election monitoring mission, spoke with Carter Center observers stationed around the country, and met with representatives of the political parties. Well, I think the main thing we've done is to promote the concept of freedom and democracy in countries that had never known what an election was, or what the right of a person to choose his own leaders was. And this has been a transforming experience for many people. Across the pond, outside President Carter's window, lives a statue called Sightless Among Miracles by R.T. Wallen of Alaska. President Carter keeps a smaller version of this statue in his office. It depicts a blind man being led by a young boy, a typical scene in many remote parts of Africa, and one often caused by a disease known as river blindness. The Carter Center and strong partners work with national ministries of health in Africa and Latin America to eliminate this disease that affects tens of millions of people and is one of the leading causes of preventable blindness in the world. Together, the center and partners have all but wiped out river blindness from the Americas and are making great strides in endemic countries in Africa. So it is entirely possible that the scene captured in these statues will become a thing of the past. Guinea worm was the first one we started with. And when we go into these countries, which are the poorest, most isolated in the world, we see other diseases that people are suffering from. And so it's just grown one thing after another. It's not all business with President Carter, however. Behind his desk, you will see handmade artwork from his grandson, Hugo, and a Father's Day card from grandson, Joshua along with photos of family and friends. A bust of President Carter's favorite poet, Dylan Thomas, sits behind his desk. Similarly, a painting of Dylan Thomas hangs in his home office in Plains. You will also find a CD player in President Carter's office, along with several tall stacks of CDs, from classical music to opera to more contemporary artists like Willie Nelson, the Allman Brothers Band, and Bob Dylan. Music has had such an impact on President Carter's life and been such an important part of his legacy that a movie was made about it called Jimmy Carter, Rock and Roll President. He wept the first time he saw it. Remember the Thornton Oots painting of President Carter that Mrs. Carter could view from her desk? This portrait of Rosalind and daughter Amy was painted by the same artist and is placed so President Carter can gaze upon it as he works at his desk. As we turn to exit President Carter's office, you will notice a vase from Prince El Hassan Ben Talal of Jordan, the late King Hussein's brother. It is inscribed in Arabic, El Jalil, Halul, and El Shamua. El Jalil is a town in Palestine. Halul is a town in the West Bank. El Shamua means candle, a symbol for peace. One of President Carter's greatest wishes has been for peace in the Middle East. 
While president, he successfully negotiated the Camp David Accords, which led to the historic peace treaty signed between Israel and Egypt that has lasted to this day. President Carter has continued this quest both personally and through the work of the Carter Center, which has had programs in Israel, Palestine, Syria, and other countries in the region. Outside President Carter's office, where he can see it every day, hangs a photo of him and Vice President Walter Mondale. On it, Vice President Mondale inscribed the following, to my president from the first vice president in history who came to love the president he served. I shall be forever grateful, Walter Mondale. In 2006, when asked to comment on the legacy of the Carter Mondale White House, Mondale said this. Since we have left office, I've often been asked this question. What were your chief accomplishments? And the longer I think about it, this is what I would claim. And that is we told the truth, we obeyed the law, and we kept the peace. Truth-telling and peace-building have always been among President Carter's core values. As we enter the presidential conference room, we come to the last stop on our tour. Each president is given a set of flags when he takes office, a presidential flag, an American flag, and flags representing the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard. The flag for each branch of the armed forces carries battle streamers that bear the names and dates of major military campaigns. Battle streamers are added as campaigns are waged. President Carter is proud that no battle streamers were added during his time in office. I have the consolation to reflect that during my administration, we did not fire a single bullet, we did not drop a single bomb, and we did not launch a single missile. So we had an administration without any wars. It was that continued yearning for a world at peace that led President and Mrs. Carter to found the Carter Center. And through health and peace programs around the world, the center sustains their legacy of waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope. Most work of the Carter Center is in remote villages in the poorest nations in Africa. And there, I have witnessed the capacity of destitute people to persevere under heartbreaking conditions. I have come to admire their judgment and wisdom, their courage and faith, and their awesome accomplishments when given a chance to use their innate abilities. We've had some wonderful experiences, whether working in the field of mental health or with caregivers or immunization programs or visiting some of our Carter Center programs. We've been very privileged. The American people have given us unlimited chances, unlimited opportunities. And we have wonderful friends who support our programs here at the Carter Center and make it possible for us to do things that we never would ever have been able to do.